Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series, The Good, The Bad, and Philosophy. In this video, we're going to be looking at what is pluralistic consequentialism. Now, classical utilitarianism that we checked out in the previous video is hedonistic, or in other words, the only type of consequence that matters is pleasure. In this video, we're going to look at a variety of other ways to measure consequences, including some versions of hedonism, some versions that are not hedonistic, and some other versions of kind of pluralistic consequentialism, and the pros and cons of each of those views. Now, some of the first critics of utilitarianism objected to the fact that all pleasures were equal. It seems strange that the pleasure you might get from eating a pound of bacon and viewing a beautiful painting would be viewed equally. These critics wanted there to be something more valuable about viewing great works of art or hearing beautiful poetry than kind of carnal pleasures of just eating a pile of meat. Many would claim that we should value the painting more than the bacon. While some utilitarians might stand their ground, others modified the position in a number of ways to avoid the objection. Two such ways were to profess either quantitative hedonism or qualitative hedonism. Quantitative hedonism claims that some things give more pleasure than others, and something like a work of art will create more pleasure than a pound of bacon. Though, there's certainly debatable if that is true. Qualitative hedonism, on the other hand, claims that there are different levels of pleasures. You have high pleasures and low pleasures. These higher pleasures are better than lower pleasures. But distinguishing between these two categories and the two qualities of experiences is going to prove very difficult for the qualitative hedonist, much less comparing the consequences with varying degrees of both. Should we, is it better to have something that has five units of high pleasure and three units of low pleasure, or 20 units of low pleasure and one unit of high pleasure? And this is going to be a critique that's going to come back over and over again for the pluralist of any color. But for qualitative hedonism, the problem is how do we distinguish between these high and low pleasures and how can we compare different consequences that have varying degrees of both? In my opinion, the best recourse is for the utilitarian to bite the bullet and argue that lower pleasures are actually valuable, i.e. bacon is delicious. Another criticism raised against classic utilitarianism, though, is the claim that the utilitarian would be committed to finding a world where we are all hooked up to pleasure machines, or Ufeo machines. Check out my video on the Ufeo thought experiment or the Euphoria thought experiment for more on that, that simulate a great life, a better place than one that does not have them. Once again, that utilitarian might double down and say, what are video games but pleasure machines and aren't those good? Wouldn't it be really cool if we could all put ourselves in the matrix, but it would only take a minute of our time to live out a whole different life, wake up, do it all over again with another life, and be able to do that ad nauseum? That seems like a really good thing. Though some, of course, might argue, well, are you really fulfilling your life then? There's an argument there. But some utilitarians that actually feel this is a serious criticism might consider something else that we should be maximizing other than pleasure. Maybe there are other things in our life, maybe including pleasure, but adding on to that that we might maximize, or maybe there's something very different. One such alternative consequence that one might advocate for is desire or kind of preference consequentialism. In this version, instead of maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain, we attempt to maximize fulfilled desires and minimize unfulfilled desires. However, this starts to become very difficult when desires start conflicting. Our intuition is that there would never be a point where one person's desire to, say, kill another person would overwhelm that other person's desire to live. But what if a large number of people want someone dead? At what point do me and all my friends' desires to kill you overwhelm your desire to want to live? Would the fulfillment of all our desires allow for us to kill you? 
and how can we compare these different desires between people? It seems that someone's desire to live is much more important than someone's desire to just eat a huge amount of bread, but those desires might conflict. If there's only so much bread in the world and one person's about to starve and one person's just stuffing their face, how do we compare those desires? What makes one more valid? Or are they equally valid? This leads us to pluralism. So some consequentialists argue that one goal is not sufficient to capture what we mean by good. These consequentialists are known as pluralists. They claim that we are not trying to maximize a particular good, but rather several goods, or a particular group of goods. This allows them to avoid the claim that consequentialists can't claim that lying, breaking promises, or going against someone's rights is always wrong, because it might actually increase overall happiness. And some consequentialists are really concerned about that. They're worried that if, well, we can lie to increase happiness, we can break promises as long as it increases happiness, we can go against people's human rights as long as it increases happiness, what kind of society are we really living in? So they might say, well, maybe there are other goods that we want to maximize as well. But the general problem here, as with many of these theories, is how can we choose between actions when different choices may maximize different goods? Some other consequences we might want to value include truth, beauty, personal welfare, love, freedom, perfection, or human rights. And the last of which can look very similar to kind of patient-centered deontology. When advocating for multiple values or good consequences, the consequentialist must provide some method of ranking these goods against each other. Does happiness outrank beauty? Does truth outrank love? By how much? By a factor of two? Of ten? This is easier said than done. Does my enjoying it allow me to buy and burn a famous masterpiece? What about buy and burn ten famous masterpieces? Should I tell those I love the harsh truth? At what point does telling a white lie turn into something that you're doing that's wrong? These are really tough distinctions to parse. And when you're in a consequentialist view, since only the consequences matter, the consequence of lying but also making someone happy may both be valued. So we have to figure out at what point does making them happy become more important than telling a lie. Without a very, very clear framework of exactly, kind of mathematically, how we can say, well, I can lie up to this point of happiness, but if I go a step beyond that, it doesn't work. I shouldn't lie, I should tell the truth. It seems that this theory is dead in the water. It seems this theory can't practically give us advice on what is good and what is not good in the world with anything beyond just kind of our basic intuition of what we should do or how we should feel. Now, in response to some of these problems, some consequentialists determine correct actions by a ranking of possible worlds instead of adding up total good consequences. Since it's tough to add kind of apples and oranges of rights and pleasures or of happiness and beauty, it seems that maybe we would rank our possible worlds. This keeps us from needing to answer the question whether one lie is worth one loving relationship but rather ask which world ranks higher based on all of the consequences operating differently than any one individually. Advocates of this position might say that, well, we might even say that evil people being less happy is actually a good thing. So it's bad to be counting just overall pleasure. We want to look at the whole scope of things. We want to provide context. We want to say, well, these evil people, them being happy, uh, that pleasure is actually going to count against you because they're bad people. The claim here is that you should always choose the action which would bring you to a world higher up in that ranking of possible worlds. However appealing this may seem, 
I'm particularly concerned about such a kind of consequentialism taking away some importantly unique features of consequentialism. Consequentialism is arguably unique among ethical theories in that very little of it is subjective. There seems to be, at least if you go back to classical utilitarianism, some objective fact of the matter about which choice makes more people happy in any particular case. It seems that while one might not be able to practically do this, there is some fact of the matter of how much happiness would happen from this choice and how much happiness would happen from some other choice. However, when we start ranking worlds based on how they are in totality, it becomes much more subjective which situation is actually better. Is it worse for bad people to be happy? How bad do you need to be for your happiness to start counting against that world? If you tell a lie, then is it bad for you to be happy? If you steal some bread, is then it bad for you to be happy? And does that stick with you for the rest of your life? Or does that badness kind of go away if you reform yourself or if you change? There's so many questions here with how we could possibly analyze a world in its totality as opposed to analyzing the individual consequences. In fact, this seems to just be the objection to any kind of pluralistic consequentialism rearing its head again. If I can't decide if love or beauty is better, how can one decide if a world with more love or a world with more beauty is better? We've just taken the same objection and put it on a global scale and hoped that you don't notice because it's so big. How are we going to rank the worlds? only through biased, irrational means. Lacking some strict system of why worlds are better than others, this theory seems particularly lacking, and I would be skeptical that even such a system would be able to appropriately parse out all of those individual distinctions in a way that would be intuitive for everyone. This theory seems to get too complicated and too big and use that to kind of seduce people into finding it intuitive. That was pluralistic consequentialism. Next up, we're going to be looking at expected consequentialism, and then we're going to move on to virtue ethics, looking at virtue, agent-centered virtue ethics, and target-centered virtue ethics. Watch this video and more here at carnades.org, and stay skeptical, everybody.